So, very interesting para. Where is describing the all the synthetic movements in India because there have been many also which are not synthetic but exclusive movement. Okay, so he is listing. First he says Vedic, then he says Upanishads, then he says Gita, then he says the Tantra. So these are all the four synthetic movements. He is not even mentioning his own synthetic yoga. That's the last and the fifth one. So one by one we'll see what is the synthesis that he is talking about. So there, there have been other synthesis, okay, and the long history of Indian thought. He has told you previously that it is the uh, Gita. So what the Gita is, again he has mentioned, and we'll discuss that when we come to it. The third one. So the first one is the we start with the Vedic synthesis of the psychological being of man in its highest flights and widest rangings of divine knowledge, power, joy, life. and glory with the cosmic existence of the gods pursued behind the symbols of the material universe into those superior planes which are hidden from the physical sense and material mentality big sentence but he is we we'll look at the importance of each word okay so first of all the vedic synthesis what is the vedic uh, vedas uh, synthesizing they are synthesizing the spirit and matter okay or one phrase which is there the heavens is our father and the earth is our mother so this is there in the veda and very clearly they are saying both are different aspects I and mean, both are real and both have to be taken care of this was the idea also in our indian system because all the the truth of the caste system is exactly that okay so all the four things you have to uh, take into account even the last one the shudra also the lowest of the they are all to be done also we have the idea of kama artha dharma moksha okay so all have to be taken into account even kama has not to be rejected you have to go through the experience then artha you earn your living okay you make a family and earn your living then uh, once you have done that and passed on then you go to moksha uh, sorry dharma uh, dharma and then finally you come to <coughs> moksha liberation so shrimdu says very interesting in one place he says this concept is wonderful but that last one is a small problem and that is what caused the downfall of india spiritually apparently spiritually because moksha means running away from the physical world <laughs> sanyasa also you see you have the for uh, the brahmacharyam na then the grihas mm. then vanaprastha and finally and the sanyasa so sanyasa. so say that sanyasa idea was the problem which was not there in the vedas okay so that caused the downfall there should be no running away from the physical world in fact in fact the idea was so clear in india na just now we discussed brahmacharyam okay grihastham you have to go through the family life okay give pl- place proper place even to what nature has given you sex and desire okay that also has a place we don't reject it we have to purify it again palu's transformation <laughs> okay so so this is what the synthesis was a vedic synthesis no rejection of the physical world at all and that is the reason why in ancient india everything was included we had 64 shastras and those shastras included everything in the physical world metallurgy astronomy surgery shushruta okay all these were there there was that was all gleaning with the physical world and metallurgy will be surprised okay people used to come from arabia and other countries to make their swords because we had the mastered the idea the uh, the techniques of uh, metallurgy they used to come and buy the metal to make their swords okay so this is all a fact so not only that we have in delhi we have that um, in qutub minar we have a, a huge um, pillar pillar apart, which does not rust <laughs> thousands of years so ashoka that, pillar ah yeah that's right okay so this was the vedic synthesis not only that the 64 shastras included even kama sutra okay while you are at it you learn to enjoy the sex also so that is the first phase 
that doesn't mean to say that you introduce that into uh, spiritual life no it's not that but you don't reject it you go through the process you don't reject the physical world that was the vedic synthesis okay so now what is he saying let's look carefully at the words we start with the vedic synthesis of the psychological being of man in its highest flights okay the highest and widest rangings of divine knowledge now this is something very interesting because we have constantly speaks of height and widening okay the widening is very important also because it should include everything okay science is doing widening it is knowing more and more at a horizontal level okay at the material level it is knowing more and more is extending its borders horizontally but spiritually the ascetic and all that they are only realizing vertically but they are not paying any attention to the widening okay we know more and more about metals we know more about life okay we know so many things that's a widening so you don't reject the widening also in fact look at the idea of widening in sherm do okay i'll just give you one example nothing much more than that literature take literature now sherm do says what would widening be literature at the highest level which savitri represents obviously all the inspiration is coming from the super mind and over mind okay now what about the widening Shemdo says all forms of literature should be resorted to. It should be practiced. In other words, what poetry? There are so many different types of poetry. Epic poetry, okay? Epic poetry. <coughs> we had in Ramayan and Mahabharat are the greatest epics in the world. Okay? They go to twenty-four to a huge number of uh, words. Savitri also is exactly. It's an epic, twenty-four thousand lines. Okay, the largest epic in English literature. There is nobody like that. Then what about only epics? No. What about sonnets? Small sonnets of fourteen uh, lines each. Okay. Then what about novels? You should include even novels in your idea of literature, and that's what Sir Mudar has done also. He has given. What about short stories? He has done short stories also. Okay. So he is ex- examining everything. Okay. he also tried another epic ilian that also is an epic so poetry prose short stories okay so dramas dramas exactly dramas literary this is the widening okay so what he means by widening is horizontally widening your scope and going into every possible activity is an interesting idea na the widening at every level there should be widening at the spiritual level what would be the widening don't exclude only the lower include also the lower don't think that jnana yoga is the only way there is bhakti yoga also then there is also karma yoga karma karma yoga all these this is a widening okay so include everything all experiences don't reject any don't go only vertically like spiritual um, exclusivists are doing and don't go only horizontally like the scientists are doing include both okay so that was the vedic synthesis astronomy is well known now astronomy okay um metallurgy okay we knew very well that the earth is round and when did the um, europeans discover that only 500 years ago <laughs> so we knew it from hundreds of uh, so many years ago and if you read the ramayana also there is reference to all this okay the roundness of the physical world and all this is there everywhere so it was known that's a vedic synthesis okay so and also I'll, the other words also were there for vedic synthesis of the psychological being of man in his highest flights and widest rangings of divine knowledge power joy life and glory see all are to be included with the cosmic existence of the gods because they <coughs> is <laughs> are constantly speaking of the gods varuna mitra aryaman okay all the gods and the goddesses ila saraswati <coughs> mahi all these are the goddesses so they all represent all the over mind level okay they pursued behind the symbols of the material universe the symbols of the material universe which the vedas use veda uses is mainly sacrifice okay sacrifice and that is one symbol that they use and the other symbol is drinking soma soma wine enjoyment <laughs> okay but they are symbols so sir so, is very clearly saying hello so, 
Hello. Yes. Yeah. Tell me. Now, when did the Vedic period exist? Oh, that I told you, na. India has a um, very bad historical sense. But what is interesting is, other day I was also saying, nowadays with genetic coding, okay, they can discover the aging also roughly. There is what is called carbon dating. You know that, na? From the carbon yeah, dating. Yeah, and they found they found that uh, Ram was born some twenty-eight thousand years ago. <laughs> yeah, so there may be some exaggerations also. Uh, we have to take. This is not a very uh, accurate science still, but carbon dating is a fairly good way of getting an approximate idea. So they say the Vedic period is about at least five to eight thousand years earlier, at least. Okay, the uh, Harappan civilization and the Mohenjo-daro civilization they say is five thousand years. Okay, and five thousand years means. Two thousand to three thousand years before Christ, even okay. So, very very ancient culture. So the Vedic period, we don't have exact um, exact dating. We can't say, but at least five to eight thousand years earlier. Okay. So, just the other day I was watching also because nowadays this and also this Aryan theory got smashed up entirely because of the. Because of the genetic coding, they have found out that all this is nonsense. <laughs> the Aryan race coming from the Arctic regions and invading India—all that is bullshit. <laughs> Absolutely nonsense. <laughs> so now everybody has ag agreed that Aryan theory is rubbish. Okay, so, so very difficult to say. But these new methods of scientific research are appearing, and it's very interesting. So they can carbon dating, then uh, co genetic coding—all these things are very interesting. They are discovering so many interesting things. Okay, so <clears throat> they they have said also that uh, the landmass of India uh, emerged first from the sea, before it the whole earth was covered by ocean, no water, and yeah. the landmass of India came up first according to the genetic and uh, thing. Yeah, there yeah there are so many theories, and what is interesting is if you take the land masses, okay, you can actually like a jigsaw puzzle, you can put them together and they fit. Mm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yes. they, they fit. But only, India yeah. was originally part of Africa. That's right. Africa was part of India. <laughs> so you can take it any way you want. I think it's better no. to say that Africa was part of India. <laughs> no, all the continents were together attached. No, and then the tectonic plates were they separated exactly. the exactly continents. And the tectonic plates are even now they are moving. They move at mm, yes. one centimeter every hundred years. Okay, mm. but that one centimeter every hundred years, the pressure is so great that you have earthquakes all over the world, and the uh, Himalayas are still rising <laughs> because of the pressure. <laughs> and there is another thing which you may know or may not know about the tectonic plates. Okay, there is a huge fault line in California. Did you know that? is a very interesting thing and they are saying it is not a question of uh, uh, if it's a question of when when that yeah whole western part of california is going to sink and fall down okay this, this is uh, which what happened in india okay dwarka the city of dwarka was very very it's there in all our indian literature but today it's at the bottom of the sea dwarka okay so <laughs> They found that it is still there. So this is the uh, this can happen. So this um, uh, what you are saying is absolutely true. All the land masses were together, and like a jigsaw puzzle, okay, they fit perfectly well. So Vedic uh, Jasmine's question about the aging, uh, not very easy, but definitely we can say five thousand to eight thousand years. See, even five thousand to eight, they are saying it could be even more. It could be even beyond ten thousand. Years, so that's a Vedic synthesis, all right. And the Vedic synthesis, they are using all the gods, the cosmic gods, as symbols, and also the symbols. And I told you two symbols mainly. They use all sorts of other symbols also. The main symbol used is the Vedic sacrifice. That is something that runs through the entire Rig Veda, entire Rig Veda. Sacrifice, sacrifice. Doesn't mean to say only pouring ghee in a fire and sitting around and going on chanting mantras. No, that's a physical sacrifice. But 
it is a spiritual sacrifice you give whatever you have to the divine so that's why even the gita also uses the concept of yajna sacrifice but there it is purely symbolic okay. so when max muller and all that yeah tell there me. is a difference between sacrifice and offering no um uh yeah it depends on what you value you give to the words na but mm. sacrifice yeah you offer what you have okay mm. and whatever you are doing you offer so in a sense there is a little bit of a overlapping na of the two you sacrifice in the, in the present sense is something you give unwillingly whether ah, an uh, offering is you give willingly okay right if you say that then <laughs> yeah but even at our human level i can offer also something a little unwillingly <laughs> <laughs> so it depends so then it will be called sacrifice yeah so that in the gita we are read in the gita and we'll come to that the sacrifice has to be very very happy sacrifice in fact if you do it in the right way you will see that when you are sacrificing you get 10 times more than what you are giving away <laughs> okay mm. the recompense is 10 times more not less <laughs> okay so the symbol so i told you one sacrifice the second symbol is a soma wine okay uh, the drinking that's a ananda getting the ananda and you get that from what you get that from the aushadhaya aushadhaya are the plants in the physical world also we get our wine and our um, alcohol from plants okay plants. rice barley grapes so that is a symbol but the in the way it means ananda and that's why it's very interesting we used to have the gentleman mother's embroidery department is there that the side of dispensary that house belonged to dorisame ayangar okay and dorisame ayangar used to have a good deal of fun and used to say oh these vedic uh, fellows they are all drunkards is <laughs> 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 to say that. okay we say that everybody is they are all drunkards <laughs> so these are the symbols okay so of the material universe into those superior planes which are hidden from the physical sense and material mentality not the word material mentality we have discussed this many times also before the you have to have the concept of the three minds the physical mind the vital mind and the pure mind the pure mind is your rationality and reason which looks only for knowledge okay so this is the what sen is saying the vedic synthesis was combining both spirit and matter heaven and the earth okay so the crown of this synthesis was in the experience of the vedic rishis something divine transcendent and blissful in whose unity the increasing soul of man and the eternal divine fullness of the cosmic godheads meet perfectly and fulfill themselves this word fulfill is also another favorite of sri ramdas everything in the physical world also has to be fulfilled the body has a right to fulfillment the vital has a right to fulfillment the mind also has a right to fulfillment not rejection the ascetics are saying impossible to fulfill the demands of the body impossible to fulfill the demands of the vital too too imperfect and too perverse can't do it sri ramdas says can be done okay the vedas also say that fulfillment the word fulfillment is very often used by sri ramdas complete satisfaction okay so, so here she he says fulfill themselves so the cosmic godheads also get fulfillment by unity with the divine with the soul yes. of man because of god, the uh, the uh, go, cosmic godheads okay they are symbols okay Mm-hmm. Varuna is a symbol of wideness. Okay, Mitra is a symbol of love. Okay, so uh, they're all uh, they're all symbols of uh, all the gods are symbols actually. They represent each mm-hmm. thing. The impersonal aspect of everything in the physical world, there's a god representing. Okay, that's the truth of personality and impersonality. Suppose we have wind in the world, which is impersonal, but there is a wind god. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. Who is the wind god? Maruta, Maruta, Maruta. They call the okay. water. Also, there is a wind god. Then there is a all these god, rain, parjanya. There is a wind god, rain god. All these are 
representation representatives of the impersonal forces so they are symbols okay so that's a vedic now we come to second synthesis the upanishads the upanishads there are by the way there are 105 6 upanishads huh? there are many many minor upanishads were very beautiful but the main upanishads are 12 to 13 shrinder has translated is contains 12 upanishads basically uh, shankara also has mentioned also 12 12 to 13 okay so <clears throat> the upanishads take up this crowning experience of the earlier seers earlier seers the vedic seers that's why the upanishads are called the veda anta vedanta vedanta philosophy means at the end of the vedic period the upanishads came into me okay as we have explained in the life divine the <clears throat> vedic are there's a philosophy in the vedas there's only experiences okay and the upanishads are philosophy putting spiritual truths in mental terms that's why it becomes philosophy you come down one notch okay first of all the highest level of knowledge is spiritual knowledge the second level of spiritual knowledge is philosophy mind expressions mental expressions and the third level of knowledge is science knowledge through the senses okay practical science so these are the three levels which he mentions in the in the in the left way so now he is discussing upanishads the upanishads take up this crowning experience of the earlier years and make it their starting point for a high and profound synthesis of spiritual knowledge and what are the spiritual knowledge they all the different aspects of the uh, experiences they include okay you can have the personal aspect of the divine you can have the impersonal aspect of the divine you can have the dynamic aspect of the divine you can have the static aspect of the divine all these upanishads mention but the upanishads are not clearly enunciated like it's in the philosophy they are not clearly enunciated they are all hinted at and half as well okay that's why there are 105 upanishads okay so <clears throat> they are all they give you the truths but not in an orderly and in a very very systematic manner they don't the upanishads take up this crowning experience of earlier years and make it their starting point for a high and profound synthesis of spiritual knowledge in fact the upanishads have impressed those minds in the west which are um, uh, open to new ideas okay um, paul dyson was a german then there were many other emerson in america also he has even written a, a poem on brahma okay and they had read the gita also so they are, some of them have been open to the upanishads in fact one of them said that the upanishads is my is the greatest scripture and it has changed my life altogether i forget the name of that uh, uh, german i forget but they were studied in the in the west okay so spiritual knowledge they draw together into a great harmony all that had been seen and experience not the word seen and experience not for mental knowledge but experience and seen by the inspired and liberated knows of the eternal throughout a great and fruitful period of spiritual seeking the between the uh, the vedic period was a period of great spiritual seeking and finding not only seeking <laughs> the third synthesis is the gita okay so the, the, what does gita combine that also we will see we have seen what the vedic combines what the upanishads combine what does the gita combine it combines jnana yoga bhakti yoga karma yoga it also combines vedanta and sankhya they are opposites but one is dualistic and one is mono, monotheistic but they gita uses both for its philosophy so it is synthetic okay so it does not say only love it does not say only knowledge it does not say only works although they are sometimes interpreted like that okay <clears throat> but it is not like that it is it includes all <clears throat> I think uh, I think Pallu, <laughs> I think I yes. told you once, na? Huh? You read the uh, the Gita itself, yes. and you oh, Pallu sent me a a very interesting thing that in um, Indian Institute of Management in uh, Ahmedabad, they are going to start the Gita. Okay, <laughs> so management. If you have to manage others and you have to manage businesses and you have to manage labor, how can you do that without managing yourself? 
So you have to become master of yourself first. So the Gita is going to be taught there. Okay. And I can tell you one thing. Many of these high officials and you know office holders, okay, well educated, they know the Gita, and many of them have read even the Upanishads. So okay? it's not at all very rare. They do know all these things. So the Gita. The Gita starts from this Vedantic synthesis and upon the basis of its essential ideas builds another harmony of the three great means of uh, means and powers. Love, Bhakti Yoga, knowledge, Jnana Yoga and works, Karma Yoga, through which the soul of man can directly approach and cast itself into the eternal. So the Gita is the third synthesis he is talking about. Then the fourth. There is yet another, the Tantric. Now, the Tantric is very interesting because Sri Aurobindo has a, a definitely many things common with Tantra. Okay? And this we will discuss. It is worth discussing, the Tantric, because even in the synthesis we discuss to a certain extent. But the Tantra is fantastic according to Sri Aurobindo. Let us finish the, uh, the, uh, the, what he is saying about Tantra and we will come back to it. There is yet another, the Tantric. And um, there is a footnote which uh, Yes, I mean read all the Puranic tradition, okay, all the Puranas, there are many Puranas, okay. It must be remembered, draws the richness of its contents from the Tantra. Okay? So <clears throat> that's one thing. The Tantra, which though less subtle and spiritually profound, now note that, okay, it is less subtle but spiritually profound. It makes very categorical statements. We will discuss that, okay is even more bold and forceful than the synthesis of the Gita, for it seizes even upon the obstacles to the spiritual life and compels them to become the means for a richer spiritual conquest and enables us to embrace the whole of life in our divine scope as the Leela of the Divine. Okay, this we will discuss that. And in some directions, it is more immediately rich and fruitful, for it brings forward into the foreground, along with divine knowledge, divine works, and an enriched devotion of divine love, the secrets also of the Hatha Yoga, Raja Yogas, and the use of the body. The Tantra uses the body also, okay, of mental ascesis. The word ascesis means tapasya, you can say that, okay. It's a, I think its uh, origin is Greek word, okay, for so the opening of the divine life on all its planes, to which the Gita gives only a, a passing and perfunctory attention. There you are, okay. He is giving a hint that you can even go beyond the Gita, okay. And the Tantric goes beyond the Gita. So, what is the Tantric? It is something that says there should be no rejection of anything, okay. You should be able to go through all those things which are which the yogas are saying, don't go there, it's a dangerous thing. Don't go into desire, attachment, ego, okay? Don't go into all these things. Don't go into sex, okay? Don't go into drinking. Don't go into smoking, all these things they say. Tantra says, no, I will go into all those things and yet get not affected at all. And that's why they carry this to the extreme limit, which you may disapprove of, but they say that this is what we are doing. It, that is the reason why it failed also. The real Tantra failed very often. Okay? There are two types of Tantras. Okay? One is a negative Tantra, Vama Marga, and the other is the positive one, Dakshina Marga. Okay? So the Dakshina Marga Tantra is fine, no problem. But with the Vama Marga, you can find a lot of fault. They will indulge in sex, they will drink wine, and not only drink wine, but drink it through a skull. Why do they do that? Because they want to show that it is possible, the worst possible things which you say should be rejected, need not be rejected. I can remain absolutely in the action and yet not get dirty. I can be absolutely impervious to all these things. They go and sit on a dead body. Okay? They even go and eat meat, human flesh they eat. Okay? Aghoris, they are called. Even today it is there, all these things are there even today. But of course the truth is forgotten. Okay? I think those people who do that, they are not at all very educated people and they are not, sometimes they are just beggars. Okay? 
but they do that they even look for <laughs> dead bodies and then they actually eat the uh, flesh i think it becoming rarer and rarer in modern times but still these are the so sremde is saying look at the words sremde is using bold forceful okay seizes upon the obstacles you are drinking and your sex is obstacles but it seizes upon them and spiritual life and compels them to become the means for a richer spiritual conquest in fact that's exactly what sremde is saying that the ascetic is escaping the problems of the world and going away so he achieves his purpose because he is avoiding the difficulties he is taking a shortcut but which is better if you face the problem and conquer it naturally you are master of the op- oppositions also so it is better so this concept the tantra takes to its extreme limit it does all these things okay <laughs> to a certain extent that was there also this idea of samata was there also in our idea you should be absolutely impervious to all this you know what ramkrishna is to do na he is to do say teach himself samata he is to not to be affected by anything that is samata so what he is to do in one hand he will take mud and the other hand he will take a few coins okay taka mati mati taka tapastaki what is the difference there is no difference and he would throw both of them into the <laughs> into ganges <laughs> okay so he is teaching himself now i said you something else which he did which you may feel a repellent support but that is to teach himself okay on one hand he will take chandan okay that is what everybody uses in india for beautification and um, beauty chandan okay and smear it on one hand and the other hand he will smear even what you can guess <laughs> human <laughs> excreta okay tapataki so both are matter <laughs> so this is how you develop the complete imperviousness to everything in the physical world and tantra does that to the extreme limit okay so now i told you that there is a resemblance between tantra and same those what are the three things which are common to both one non rejection of the physical world but shrimdev does not go so far as to say you don't, don't need to do all this you don't need to drink and you don't need to but the tantric say even that i will do okay so it's very bold but it can go wrong very easily okay so that's the first non rejection of physical world second ananda is the aim of life not like the ascetic is saying only knowledge is the aim of life no ananda is the aim of life but pure ananda not vital ananda not dirty ananda okay and the third the worship of the divine mother the aspect of the shakti i will not go only through consciousness i will not go only through purusha like the others are doing most of the indian uh, systems are only going towards prakriti purusha sorry prakriti they reject but tantra says no shakti also is an aspect of the divine the divine mother and that's why they worship the kali okay so that is the three things are common to both so those yoga as well as tantra so that's also is a synthesis okay so <coughs> i'll finish the uh, paragraph he is listing all the synthesis <laughs> he is not listing his own synthesis <laughs> because that's a synthetic yoga okay the synthesis of yoga all the yoga that truths okay i go to the next sentence and also in uh, in uh, tantra he is bringing in the idea of leela okay because if ananda is the aim of life the divine is enjoying himself in the creation of everything in the physical world okay leela and there is footnote for leela also the cosmic play and what is the cosmic play creation creation of everything creation of plants creation of animals creation of new materials everything going on endlessly and in some for, for no, sorry for it and in some directions it is more immediately rich and fruitful for it brings forward into the foreground along with divine knowledge divine works and an enriched devotion of um, uh, divine love the secrets also of hatha yoga raj yoga the use of the body and of mental ascesis for the opening up of the divine life 
on all its planes to which the Gita gives only a passing and perfunctory attention. Okay, so they are using all these things. Hatha Yoga, Raja Yoga, okay, they don't reject the body, they don't reject the Raja Yoga, they don't use the vital, they make use of the body, okay. This is the Tantra, mental ascesis, the opening. So, Gita also will, Samdha will tell you later on, that the Gita also says that it's possible to live in the physical world without being affected by the physical world. So, that is similar to what Samdha is saying, but Samdha goes one step more. He says that, <coughs> the en Gita says the environment may be impure, but you don't get affected by it. The lotus leaf and water. Okay. There is also another, they, they use the image also of the duck back. You throw water on the duck back, it never becomes wet. There is an oily substance and the birds can easily flap their wings and get rid of the water. So, that is also the, the Gita's idea. But Shrindu is saying even that water which is surrounding you, that also can be made pure. Even the world can be, because there is evolution. So, he is going one step beyond the Gita. Okay. So, this is a very clear distinction between the Gita and Sri Yoga. That's why he goes beyond the Gita also. The distinction is clear, na? You yes, can, yes, Gita yes. is saying, you can live in the physical world without being affected by its impurities. Sri is saying, even the impurities in the physical world are going to change because there is evolution. All right? So, yes. that's why it's a, it's a synthesis. So, all these are synthesis. Then, we go to the next, last sentence. Moreover, it grasps at the idea of the divine perfectibility of man, the Tantra, okay? possessed by the Vedic Rishis, but thrown into the background by the intermediate ages. The Vedic truths got lost in the intermediate ages, which is destined to fill so large a place in any future synthesis of human thought, experience and aspiration. And that is exactly what Sri Aurobindo is doing. Sri Aurobindo's yoga will play a very important part. It is destined to fulfill so large a place in any future synthesis of human thought, experience and aspiration. If you look at all the uh, YouTube discussions on science and spirituality, you will see that this is becoming absolutely a reality today. Scientists are looking into spiritual concepts, okay, and spiritual uh, people are not rejecting the physical world, okay, the whole thing is going towards that. So, it is an interesting paragraph because he is listing what according to him is a synthesis. Number one, Veda. Number two, Upanishads. Number three, Gita. Number four, Tantra. Number five, which he doesn't mention, <laughs> synthesis of yoga, okay. So, we have only one minute left or two minutes left, so we'll have to stop here today. And next time, we have <coughs> two more small. So, <coughs> what he is doing, how he is developing the theme, first of all, he has told you in the first chapter how to approach the Gita. Okay? And what is its value? Its value is not in philosophy. Its value is in its practical guidance to life. Okay, You have to live the truths that Gita has to be taken in that sense. Also, our approach to Gita should not be sectarian. We should not feel that that's the only thing in the physical world, okay, which is a scripture. It's a fantastic scripture. There is no doubt about it. One of the greatest scriptures of Karma Yoga in the world. But we should not be sectarian about it like the others are. This is the only truth. You should not do anything else. That has, should not be there at all. That's, and then he is also telling you it is synthetic. So, we should approach it for guidance in our spiritual life. Then, chapter 2, there are so many different. First of all, there is a divine teacher. There is Sri Krishna, who is sitting in the chariot along with Arjuna and teaching him. So, that's the second chapter, the divine teacher. Who is the divine teacher? Okay. There is a big discussion on the avatar hood later on. It's a very complex uh, phenomena of avatar world, but we will go into that. It's very interesting, very great detail here, gone into three, four chapters on avatar world. Next, the disciple. Who is the disciple? Arjuna. Okay, so that's the next. So first of all, the general approach to Gita. Second, the Sri Krishna, the divine. Third, the human disciple, the Arjuna. And the fourth, 
Kurukshetra. What is meant by Kurukshetra? What is its symbol of? And what is its what is its, um, the, its purpose? So, and the core of the teaching, and then he goes on to the Kurukshetra. Kurukshetra also is a very interesting um, discussion about violence, okay, and violence and war. There is a truth to it. Everybody is saying, no, 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 war is bad, but peace is good. Shrinder says, no, that also is a, a divine aspect. It has become perverted, but violence and force is a divine principle. So that's what it is. This is the arrangement. We'll go one by one into each chapter and see. Okay. So, yes, Mr. Yeah. Okay. Hello, Arvind. Yeah. Hello. Tell me. Can I can I ask you a question? Go why ahead. Why is why is there such a big lacuna between the Vedic time and today? Because in those days there were neither the Mughals or the British who could have destroyed our culture. So how did we ourselves destroy our Vedic period and forgot it? Okay, I think it's a very interesting uh, question that you are asking, and according to my understanding, okay, the upper hemisphere God is perfect. The lower hemisphere, all the elements of Godhead are there, but they are imperfect. So persistence and effort also is imperfect. So the nature of everything in the physical world is remember transience. Okay. There's a nature of the physical world, transience. In other words, nothing is permanent. So, however high you go up, you will come down after a certain time in the physical world. The static condition of a realization can be there only in the higher worlds, but in the physical world, it's very difficult to do it. So, there is always, unless, yeah, there is always unless you transform it. That's right. You are right. So, that's what self is trying to do. Bring the permanence of the divine into the lower. Okay, so everything in the physical world is born. It is born first. Then it grows. Then it hits a plateau, and slowly it declines. Okay, this is and it ends in death. This is the law in the physical world: transience, impermanence. So naturally, it's an interesting question that you are asking. But if you consider from this point of view. The principles in the physical world, transience, impermanence, however high you go, it is going to come down one day, unless you transform it. And that's exactly what Sri is trying to do. Bring the permanence of the higher into the lower. Then it will be possible. Rangada, in that sense, in the uh, Vedic time, everyone was not a rishi. You no, know? there were uh, like ordinary people too. Absolutely. So that is the that is the problem. That was the problem. That's right, but that will always be there. Uh, yes. That will always yeah, be and, uh, uh, yeah. Unless everyone tries to transform themselves, that and is the they way. will, they will transform, but at different times, na? Yes. Yes. So this is another very interesting thing you must know. When man came into evolution, the animals did not disappear. When the yes. animals came, the plants did not disappear. Okay. Then, <coughs> similarly. When this the uh, yoga, what is it? The super mind comes. Man is not going to disappear. He will be there. Okay. So it's a pyramidal structure. At the lowest level, the number of pure atoms is larger than the number of animals that are there. The animals, when the plants come up, the number of sorry, plants first. Okay. Then animals. So animals are less than the plants. Then the human beings. Are less in number than the animals, and the superman will be less in number than the humanity. So it's a pyramidal structure. So as it keeps going up higher and higher, it's going more to like a pyramidal structure. So the lower things will continue to remain, but each one will be helped to go to the next level. Man will be will find it easier to come to supermanhood. The animal will find it easier to come to human uh, condition. Okay. So this whole thing will be helped uh, downward, but it will not disappear. This inconscience will remain, the plants will remain, the animals will remain, human beings will remain, but the supermental beings will come up. So, so that's the thing. So the fall of the Vedic period that was bound to happen at one time. Or another. 
look at the largest um, king uh, empires in the world the roman empire the british empire he said the sun never sets on the british empire how long did it last limited time it may last even 300 years 400 years but it will disappear one day <laughs> unless the roots are deeply planted inside like he says about the ashram he says the roots of the ashram are planted deep in truth so, <clears throat> even in the ashram na we may be saying something which may be blasphemy to many but the conditions that were there when mother and shivam were there are not there anymore we know that at the physical level okay things have deteriorated there's no doubt about it. but that doesn't mean to say that you can't take advantage okay you have to plug yourself into the atmosphere that is there everywhere okay and you <clears throat> can't use your phone unless you plug into the circuit you can't use your iron okay your iron box okay unless you plug it into and use it then the heat comes okay so exactly you have to plug into it and the plugging device is there in the ashram you have to plug into it you have to tune yourself into it then you will get the but physically there is a great deterioration there is no doubt about it <laughs> that's the nature of the world transience imperfection okay impermanence yes men you know it huh. is so very paradoxical that yes with the supramental manifestation coming on earth yes. but at the same time we have all this terrorists isis and taliban and what not that's exactly what i said just now all these will remain <laughs> but it will not remain at the lowest at the highest level see man has got intelligence now does the animals have intelligence no so exactly in the same way the divine perfection will be there in the superman but the imperfections of man will continue to remain <laughs> that's the whole thing the transformation of matter means there will be a sampling matter became life with a sampling okay all matter did not become life similarly all animals did not become intelligent human beings okay. similarly the divine super mind will also be a sampling okay this is possible in the will remain as a sample okay so. merci boku okay merci boku rangada bon journée bon journée everybody au revoir au revoir nice thank you okay. thank you rangada au revoir au revoir thank you rangada okay